welcome back to Chazine TV and Chidiago. I'm so delighted that you are joining us today. For those not familiar, this is the beautiful Chidiago writer and founder of She Roars, supporting women around the world to connect to the power of their roar. I get goosebumps and excitement when I say that, Chidiago, <laughs> in a year which has been intense, incredible, through so much intensity. Intensity feels like the word, the most intense year, I would say, in many, many different ways but also an incredible year of healing. So give me your thoughts. How has 2020 fared for you and your community of women? Hmm. 2020 is that year. First of all, perhaps just want to thank you for having me, Tazeen. You know, we, we met in this year in a circle of women and here we are again. And I think in many ways, this is one, the flip side of this cloud, the heaviness of the cloud to the extent that there has been a pandemic this year and there's been so much happening. But on the flip side, there seems like there's an emergence of a lot of um, spaces that did not exist before. I've most certainly experienced this with the people I've connected with this year and the ways that we've been able to connect um, from the comforts of our homes or um, but connected around the world, so to say. And I believe that's in many ways the core of 2020 for me, this interconnectedness of our shared humanity. The word that encapsulates that is Ubuntu, right? And this year Ubuntu took on an even bigger word or meaning I should say, because within our interconnectedness, there's the, the fears that came to the surface, right? And we all carry fears and to feel each other and to see the ways that we're all connected in our fears and our struggles, however different, but ultimately um, very present for so many in, um, in the, in the pains that hadn't been healed, generations that um, perhaps, you know, can be captured by Black Lives Matters movements and really the different marginalized communities, um, including women, um, really connecting deeply, not just to their pain, but to their power and to the sense that this does not serve us to continue to not uphold all our communities, all people, especially in a world that is just enough already in terms of the difficulties and the challenges without those that are imposed um, uh, subjectively, you could say, so, or arbitrarily, you know, there's just no reason to, to, to keep so many down when there's such an abundance in terms of, um, the potential of working together and supporting each other in that spirit of Ubuntu. So it's your question, 2020 has been a year of seeing our shadows, our fears, our pain, the healing that wants to happen and seeing the potential when we look all of this in the eye and, and breathe into the desire for something different where everyone is supported in the spirit of Ubuntu and brotherhood and sisterhood, mm -hmm. knowing that we can't do this alone, we need each other. And my hope is that moving forward, we can leverage these beautiful spaces and connections and healing that have happened on an individual and collective community level to support this bigger healing that is needed on so many levels right now. Um, to usher in a world that can be a little bit more supportive of people and the environment. So beautiful. And I think I, I, I hadn't actually heard that word and I love it when you say it and I want to just sit with it even more, Ubuntu. I mean, tell me more, take me into the inner 
meanings of Ubuntu? That word came to me as well. It was in 2012. And I was to do a graduation speech and looking for, a, a, you know, like an angle and it came and it's been with me ever since. And it's Ubuntu. I'll say that again, Ubuntu. And there are words that have vibration. This is a, this is, I want to say African word, but in truth, it's, um, it's from the Southern Africa region, the Bantu, Bantu language. And it, means many different things, the different translations at the core is I am because we are. And the we is not just you and I, it's that interconnectedness, right? I was just learning yesterday how leaves from a tree fall into the water and that produces plankton, which feeds the fish. So without the trees, everything is connected. That's the law of nature the seasons, the acorn falling just at the right time for the squirrel, the, the, the leaves and the, 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 the seedlings, and I could go on and on. It's the law of nature. We're not separate. So Ubuntu acknowledges that not just with the environment, but with each other. Our meeting sparks something into the world, our connecting here and sharing like this sparks something. We might never know what that is. And so it goes, every action, every word, every thought um, contributes to this Ubuntu. So that's how I see it. It's that moment we acknowledge that we are part of a greater whole and we matter, right? You're, you're such an important part of the whole. And I think the more aware we can be of that magic or the, 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 what that means, you know, to be alive and to, to be Ubuntu um, for one another, for the environment, for, for this lifetime and the lives to come, I think there is a, that we can, it means also step into your own power, maybe the daily question of what, how can I live today in a way that can bless this day, can bless myself, can bless another? And we all know that it could be as little as a smile, mm. right? And it could be as big as sharing love. But at the core, it's just knowing that we are not separate from the whole and that we're held by the whole and that we can truly um, be very conscious of our contributions. Ubuntu, I am because we are. So, so beautiful. I was just reflecting on what you've just shared and quite a few things are coming to heart. There's a prayer actually from Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and starts with, we have awakened and all of creation has awakened for God, sustainer of all the worlds. God, I ask you for the best the day has to offer, opening support, light, blessings, guidance. And I seek refuge in you from any harm in it and any harm that may come or might come after it. I mean, what you've shared seems so simple and on one level, it really is. And yet on the other level, and it's interesting you talk about this, I am because we are in this very polarized year, right? This year where we've had to go into our little microcosms of existence, just these very, you know, here in the UK, we've got tier two, tier three, and it's all about stay in your bubble. So stay within your, sort of isolated little pockets of my, you know, this little micro worlds that you're in. And yet the outpouring of community spirit, the wanting to kind of serve each other builds this whole camaraderie of togetherness, even though we feel so separated and I've actually found this year has kind of almost redefined that relationship to God in knowing that that full dependence and reliance is only on that one source. 
and all of our connectedness is through the energy and blessing and grace that flows with, with that one source. Tell me more about how you've experienced this, you know, the polarization um, and also the, the layers of the dust, you know, we call it the rust that needs polishing. Um, because often they do have to be looked at full on before you can, you know, clear. And I, and I love how you talk about nature because we're seeing it right now. You know, we've just had this beautiful autumn, everything shedding away. And now the saps are retreating in the trees and everything's kind of going within. And we know that there will be that other spring, but is the time to be still outside and within? Mm. It's really beautiful to hear you weave um, as you have. I felt goosebumps when you talked about that, that um, stillness. And, you know, perhaps we start with what that means. Um, and I think my mind goes to how still there's an invitation to stillness on a daily basis. And you mentioned the prayer from the prophet and how, what came to my mind was this invitation every day to find that space of stillness, to almost breathe into your day that which you're desiring. Before we got into this interview, you you invited us to sit still and breathe and perhaps be intentional about what it is that um, we're, we're hoping for this conversation to be, right? So there's just such a beauty and simplicity in just being still. And the season forces us to remind that, to remember that. But in truth, our cycles are daily almost, right? Especially that of the, of the woman, um, we're forced to, not forced to, we're invited to be very conscious of the cycle because we, we are, we cycle with the moon and the, you have all these cycles around us really guiding us to the power of cycles and within that. Always this, you know, that be it the new moon or the full moon or, you know, there's something about or spring and summer and winter, like the, the edges of the spectrum, right? So what is your edge of the spectrum in terms of stillness and the other side um, full being fully alive, right? And to always calibrate that in your day, I find to be such a beautiful um, way to live. And this now takes us to that polarization, right? Because polar opposites are part of life. And I think when we're passive in the polarization that is, that's when it gets destructive, right? So I think there's been a lot of passive living as a whole where we just, you know, we're all in that, we're all rushing and going and doing, and we all know that. And it didn't quite feel right, but it was the game, so to say, it was the design. And we're swept up in that rush because that's the kind of creatures we are. We get swept up and, you know, we're just doing. And I see the polarization as the, the truth that, it just was not in balance the way we were living. So that's the first pol the polarization, just the first, you know, it's being out of balance. So instead of sort of that ebb and flow, right? The quiet and the, the full power, we're just sort of full power, full power, breakdown, breakdown, little rest, full power, you know? So it's like, where's your stillness? Where's your intention? Where's your um, deliberate, just um, action um, and, and um, connecting to what you need and giving yourself that? be at rest, whatever that is. So, but the polarization is 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 beyond, right? It's 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 whatever it means to be out of balance. So it, we could spend a lot of time in what exactly caused it, but we feel that. And I think this is now an opportunity to be still and look, start on the individual level, everything starts in the individual and grows into community. And you mentioned the ways that we're showing up for each other. You know, where does that come from? It comes from your own internal drive. I want to support people because I understand that there's suffering. And maybe before we've seen suffering, but it's always been so far. And we 
we, we ignore it, but now it's closer. And then there's a question to interrogate that. Why does, why am I, why am I compelled now? How can I continue to be compelled to support knowing that um, we are, um, that my, my supporting another is just a key part of the way that we can be, bring back um, that balance um, for each other. So this is to say, I find a lot of power in the individual quiet space of reflection, introspection from where you connect to that which you can contribute, be it rest for yourself, slowing down, or being there for each other and or, it doesn't have to be either or. And from there, knowing that your action, you matter and you contribute to the balance. And when we all are stepping into that intentionality, that polarization that is really just a, the after effect of, of just an um, imbalanced world will slowly, with hope, um, find its, regain its balance. But for now, find your own um, role in, and find your own balance. And that starts with stillness and quiet and tuning in and speaking and acting from that space, knowing that you are part of a whole and, um, and your integrity within yourself is the greatest gift that you can give to that whole. It's interesting because you said though that, that we all matter. And it is quite extraordinary how for generations upon generations, I feel like there's so much trauma and a natural love deficit actually. And that's why I've always been really deeply fascinated with ancient traditions, the saints, the Stoics, the philosophers, and the wise ones, the gurus of, of time who vibrate at such a different energy of love to the rest of humankind. And that, that really touches me when you say, you know, that, we, that, that you have to know that you matter. Again, sounds so simple. And yet it's only this year that the world said, oh, Black Lives Matter. Well, yeah, but yeah. <laughs> right? I don't know how to express it more eloquently, but... But it's interesting to observe, it's interesting to observe um, and do it really authentically, not in this culture of hedonistic social media. Look at me, look how much I matter. Because that's a distortion to the other extreme. You know, so a friend said once to me, and that just stuck with me, you know, he mentioned the saints and the sages, and he shared the, the philosophy of us being in a time where there's a need for a thousand Buddhas. And that stayed with me, and that's something that I, I tend to resonate with more and more. You know, there was a time where it's the Prophet Muhammad, a Jesus, a Buddha, a Saint X, and it's almost like one. And, and I feel that in this time, we're all being called to step into our Christ-like energy because that's the whole teaching. And you could argue that, you know, if I want, just want to use the Christ teaching, which we could call, use the Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad teaching, you could use the Buddha. It all comes back to love. And, you know, how I see it, you know, to your point, love is not the ego um, constantly fighting to be seen, right? Like, look at me, I matter, like, check me out. And that has its role because the ego you know, is not separate from you, but you can really always um, check in and say, you know, am I acting out of love? And I think the invitation, and this is in ultimately also the spirit of Ubuntu, is that when we act out of love, and I know you were talking about the divine feminine, um, which I believe is something that we carry in the male and the female, uh, in men and women, right? It's this incredible love that you could call nurturing, you could give whatever wordly labels, but ultimately it's the oneness with all that is. The, the, the divine feminine, I feel almost like the beating heart of the mother, the earth herself. So how can we 
connect to that in our own selves, that love, that generosity, that giving, that being, the simplicity within the complexity. And from there, act and show up with in full equanimity, full love and giving and trust. Um, doesn't mean that we don't feel fear. It doesn't mean that we don't despair. It means that we always find our way back to love. And I find that to be what it means to step into this time and what it means for us as a thousand Buddhas in Christ-like energy and in this moment of great crisis, how can we really truly connect to the teaching of times and times before the eternal teaching of love, love for yourself, which maybe looks like when you're the fear comes up for even yourself, what's happening, well, I just check in and don't maybe fight and hate yourself or just, you know, it's like, okay, what this is what I'm feeling and I'm struggling with this. Why, what's happening, what's, you know, and really dialogue and almost hold your fear like your own child with so much love and allow it to be seen and to be held because often that's what we need for our own healing. And it's from our own space of healing that we can support this greater healing that is calling to us, um, that has been, you could argue, the teaching of so many that came before us to prepare us for a time like this, when we all need to connect to that power that only we can un, 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 unlock, that is love. And, um, and the power of love we know is just so great, the power of the heart when we, we, we heal our own selves, when we're healing our families, when we're healing our, the imbalance within our feminine and our masculine, within the earth that we call home, then we're unlocking this greater potential of humanity that right now is not been, it's, it's, it's on the contrary, we're, we're acting so much from fear and so much from a, a lack and a scarcity and there's a desire now to know that um, we can be so much more, but that togetherness is the key. And it starts with your own ability to find that togetherness within yourself. If that feels like it makes sense, it's like find your own, your own center and then connect it to the greater center. And then, and then, you know, it's like almost see the locks all around your part of that. Find your strength and then the integrity can be more, more secure in a larger scale. Thanks for letting me talk through that. No, I think it, what you've shared is so salient because there's so much to unpack within this. You know, for women in particular, there's been this, you know, women tend to give to the point of depletion, depleting their own energy. And then often the intention for why we're giving isn't necessarily aligned to a higher authentic reason for giving. And I think what you said is really, really, definitely has been my experience, which is actually, I can't, you know, charity starts at home and actually it then starts with you. And finding that balance of, giving and serving, um, you know, that takes a lot of patience and healing and becoming really authentic and, 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 and aligned because sometimes actually the more loving thing is a very powerful no than it is to the people pleasing and doing things from a place where you're always looking for something in return. It's not that unconditional capacity to be able to give for giving sake alone as we still go through our journey and I'm just curious Chidiago the number of women that you work with how many do you feel have ever experienced true unconditional love because even the world the word love means so many different things to different hearts so I'm just curious you know, let's just start with the, with with love and and explore that a bit further. And then, if you could if you could share the women that you've been connecting with, um, 
you know, what today has been their experience of this, this loving energy? Hmm. I'm going to try and answer this question different ways. You know, one is, you know, you asked, have people experienced unconditional love? I think often the answer thinks of a mother, right? And that's a perfect example of unconditional love. I am not a mother myself. And, and um, so, but my sense is that that's a perfect example just to understand the, the, the truth of unconditional love. But how I want to answer it is slightly different, which is what I see again and again with women, with myself as well, and you know, the women that I work with is there's such a judgment of self. And over the years of exploring this within self, within with the women, um, what you see again and again is that this is founded on a fear of being judged. So we judge ourselves first, right? So, so far, nothing... You, or we're judging the other. Or, yeah, or we're judging the other all the time. Exactly. Sorry, we're also judging. So what I find is that the core um, underpinning of that is that we don't trust that there is love. Because when there is love, unconditional love, there is less judgment, right? If that's all. And that's the space that we're all living in. So we're actually working backwards. Where... Um, we're so we're working out of fear. It's I don't want to be judged. So I'm going to work harder and faster and do this and show up that way and dress this way and look this way and be this because I want people to think that I am X and I don't want them to think whatever that looks like. And as a world that has been the space that we work with, but imagine another world, another way where it's, there is love for everyone. And no matter where you're at and how you're feeling and the days that you're feeling low and you feel sad or depleted or not yourself, that you can feel that fully because you know that um, there is love, unconditional love for you, that you have first for yourself. So it's okay. Like, oh, today we don't look as the way we want to look. That's okay. I love you. And okay, we messed up with this. And ah, uh, like, ah, uh, you know, those times where we literally hit ourselves in the head. It's like, it's okay, it's okay. I, it's okay. There's, you know, so it's within our own selves and the other that you're worrying about that you can almost go and think and say, there is love for me. And I can relax into that because we're all human and we all live in the spaces of, different um, ways we show up some of them might not be to the standard that we want or expect etc all of that is part of the journey and can I have love for that so again I love what you said it starts with you and then it spills out so I find that when we can change that perspective and so the moments when you start thinking like oh like you know I just don't feel like them doing this well this is going to my boss and to come to love what is it that has been great has worked out what is going well and then you can start seeing how judgment comes in you can start identifying that a little better and you can almost start bringing love everything is helping bring love to it so the parts of you that that voice that comes up like oh my god you're so stupid what are you saying da, da, da. you can smile and send a little love kiss it's something that needs to be said or wants to be said. And you can, how can you trust that or love that? And maybe it's silly, but that's fine because it's all part of you. So it just becomes to bring a case of bringing a little love. So I find that that's the biggest shift space that I see is how you can have love for all the emotions, the fear, the insecurity. And then the more love you can infuse, the more love you can start feeling for others, the more love you can start feeling for others, the more permission you can allow for them to be in their own vulnerability, to be in their own insecurities, to be in their own um, mistakes or failures and know that it's okay because their intention is love and that almost what you, love is contagious, we say sometimes. Um, so I find that it's it's really the magic that is, but you have to give it to yourself. So when the opposite of love, anything that 
I used the word vibration earlier, so I'll borrow that when the vibration is not, it's low and heavy. You don't maybe like, oh, why am I like this? Why can't I be a little sunny? Why, you know, that's, there's no love there. But really almost feel into that and go, okay, I see you're struggling and I love you and it's okay. It'll be better. What do you need? How can I support you? Do you see the shift there? That's the big thing I see that so many of us need. Okay, need a little rest? You feel like a loser, you should be working hard. That's okay, you take 10 minutes, just relax. Everything is gonna be okay, like literally become your own best friend and then watch that love just literally expand into the world and I can promise you that. But it always starts with you activating it within your own self, which starts with you becoming a little kinder, a little more loving to yourself. You talked about sort of that connection with for many that experience of unconditional love coming from the mother it's not always the case the wounded feminine energy particularly a very traumatized energy um, is and can be extremely painful and I think one observation of this year is this huge healing that's that's coming through with the divine feminine. And I really want you to, to share more about this actually, this, you know, this experience of like women coming together moving out of that comparator, enviator, jealousy, which actually, if I really think about it very deeply, it goes far back into patriarchy and the way that women felt secure and safe was through vying for the male attention and henceforth that is how she guaranteed her security. And this is this is centuries old um, that's still with us, even in 2020. So tell me, tell me more about Divine Feminine, what it means for you and what you're witnessing. Um, thank you, Tazine. First, I'd like to almost address that wound that you mentioned, because I think there's a lot there. And this, for me, healing has been such a big word and a big, um, activation I've seen and experienced with so many women this year and, and men as well. So there's Rumi, there's a Rumi quote, um, the wound is the space um, where the light enters, right? And um, what I really love about this quote, it's so simple, but it speaks to the power of, the, of healing and the importance of the wound itself. So that wound is often one that we don't want to feel. We don't want to, we don't want to feel like we're wounded or... No one wants to feel pain. We haven't got time for it. So give me the paracetamol, give me the band-aid, or let's just ignore it and pretend it doesn't exist. Exactly, right? exactly. And guess what? Um, not only no one wants to feel it, but you know, you mentioned the lineage. Our mothers before us perhaps did not have the luxury of feeling that pain because it's overwhelming. So ultimately it becomes a, a reality of you can't give what you don't have, which is why a lot of the conversation we've had earlier is on the importance of giving to yourself, filling your cup so that you might spill over. So our mothers, um, you know, just to use that one example because we're segueing from the, the wound of the, the, the feminine, the mothers, you know, sometimes they just didn't go have their own healing. So their own capacity to maybe love or give or show up in a way that could nurture us might not have been the case, right? So that wound still very alive. And it feels like it's so interesting how our generation, if I may, encompass the different facets of this generation. And there is something about us healing into generational trauma. We can't escape it. It's just so so clear to all of us that, that we are all being called to shed something that sometimes is not ours, but it's very much ours because we inherited it and it is, we carry it and we, we embody it. 
Um, and that could be in our anger, in our, in our, in our fear of pain itself, in our, in our wounds that are so deep and our fragility and all of that. And the patriarchy hasn't helped that because the patriarchy has, has worse, has, um, the patriarchy, if you, if I may, is, is a word to capture, <sighs> stay, stay small. You, this is what you can or can't do. This is who you can or can't be. And imagine, yes, please. No, I was just saying what, what also comes to heart, you know, it's not just men upholding patriarchy. There are many, many women who subconsciously uphold it too. And I've had to really explore where subconsciously, even though part of me has become more feminist over time, for sure, but there's another part of them was like, where I question, oh my God, am I actually subconsciously? Because these things become so ingrained, right? They become like a, like how I describe these things is like wearing a skin. It's not just borrowed clothes. Clothing feels one removed, but it's like a skin. And you suddenly wake up and you realize this skin is not mine. Um, and that's how it feels with patriarchy, that it's, um, that we're still exploring what it actually means and how much has become embedded into the skin. Mm. Oh, that's, that's such a really, that's a really powerful imagery and you know, the shedding of the layers, the healing of generational trauma most certainly speaks to those stories that have been told, you know, and those are the worst the stories that others tell us and we start to believe in ourselves and then we tell others. Um, so most certainly when you've been told for generations a story that lets, you know, has been fabricated by men, but it's also the women that uphold it because the mothers, for example, are the big teachers, the grandmothers and the community and the co-worker, you know, whatever woman archetype you want to pick. So yeah, absolutely, you can't to uphold uh, a story. Uh, it takes a whole culture sometimes, literally a culture to uphold something <laughs> that is, it doesn't serve the bigger whole, but it's how it is, it's how it's done. It's culture, you know, and that usually shuts everybody up. <laughs> Um, even sometimes religion, right? And this is within Christianity as much as Islam, as much as, right? It's, and so it's, what are the stories we've been told? How did that impact you and us and our mothers? And how are we embodying it still, right? It's all through the, I was at a conference with 300 women and we spent about an hour on the debate, uh, do women uphold each other or do they pull each other down? And at 50% were very much like all women pull each other down. And other 50 is like, no, they're women who support. And that, you know, that arc, that narrative stems from, you know, you can't give what you can have. So a lot of these women that we talk about, um, and we, I might have been part of that myself at some point, or, you know, who pull okay. another down yeah. is because it's the fears are acting, the stories of only one of you can get to the top. You have to be, you know, you got to be strong. You got to be harsh. You got to, you can't be soft. Whatever that story is coming up that, so it's about you can't give what you don't have. So if you feel like you have to be a certain way because that's the only way you've learned that you can move ahead or get ahead. So it's all well, that's invitation to healing. So the divine feminine now, I think sometimes I think almost like um, you know, we mentioned nature or we mentioned divine feminine as the earth, and I think of water. I think our waters are a, a, a barometer to where we are. So when you, the, the imbalance in our water is the imbalance that we are feeling. So the divine feminine is about bringing back, for me is bringing balance to the system. And again, I, I, I don't think of divine feminine as just um, embodied in the, in the woman, but rather we all carry our divine masculine and divine feminine why women have been invited in the last um, in the last many, many decades and centuries um, 
perhaps more in the last century to embody even more so their masculine. Um, and now there's just sort of like an acknowledgement that, um, and the men have been fooling their, in their, in their, in their divine masculine and their masculine because sometimes it's also like a, a toxic masculinity. Um, mm -hmm. So when the, the, there's an imbalance in the water and nature and earth, like ultimately there's, it just, there's a rupture so that invitation of the divine feminine and this invitation to heal the, the imbalance that is within ourselves, to heal the stories that um, we carry on whatever woman's place is, whatever your place is that is less than your capacity and, put, um, and potential to contribute to the whole and to invite the, the toxic masculinity that either wants to uphold that or, 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 be, uh, or, or gain from the, this, this, or from the privileged role that it has to really question its own self and welcome a little bit of that um, that love and nurture and awareness of of her role in the support of a bigger whole. So the divine feminine for me, I just see I see as the softness, the the yin, the receiving, the nurture, the knowing that we can our we can love and uh, it's a lot. I feel like for me, it's a feeling. Please help me out. No, I, just what comes to my heart always when I really reflect on what does divine feminine, there are two things that come to heart. The first is, so my teachers, Camille Helminski and Kabir Helminski, and then one of their dear friends, a mystic, Beth Hinn, she depicts it beautifully once listening to one of her podcasts of how when the masculine and feminine energy come together, they're so, it's like this perfect sort of bridge of support, which allows the water to run freely beneath it. And often I always feel the willow tree for me is the perfect embodiment of the divine feminine, because it's not about weakness. It, there's a real rooted strength in her. And yet she will allow the breeze to take her where, so there's a flexibility and strength that creates that balance and together, I guess, overall wholesomeness. Um, and yeah, like we have had to, you know, our generation, my generation coming into the workplace on a very testosterone driven trading floor back in the heyday of, you know, when Merrill Lynch had just taken over Smith New Court, there wasn't much room for my femininity because to survive that particular jungle, it was switching on for all the testosterone <laughs> to feel heard, funnily enough. So it's a, you know, and I think a lot of women relate to that, that kind of needing to switch on that very solar, masculine, fiery energy. But I feel sort of at this point and uh, the piece that, I've, that we've done and interviews I've brought up where we explore the menopause, there does come a point for a woman where you just can't sustain that anymore because the cycle really brings you back into being with the moon and being with, with the seasonalities that, that actually feel much more familiar um, and natural to us. Uh, I really love the example of the willow and that ability to receive, to bend, to be but always deeply rooted and anchored and that the strength of its own roots and how it can support perhaps even like the entire ecosystem. Which is, and, you know, I, I was reflecting as well on the word nurture and realizing that often when you know in defining that divine feminine we say when I say nurture one's mind goes to nurturing others and my heart really wants to remind um, us that it starts with nurturing yourself right so if we want to talk about you know you mentioned the Mary Lynch floor that trade in the the testosterone my sense is you didn't have time for yourself. You were go, 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 trading floor. So that divine feminine is, you know, that ability to nurture and find your own roots because the roots at the end of the day is very much 
the source of nurture, nutrients, and the essence where it draws from all that is. So what is your ability to draw into your own roots and nurture and give yourself so that you can literally, um, you know, flourish and grow into this, this tree that is a given tree, you could say, and this ultimate um, potential that you have of self and whatever way you manifest is your tree. But it starts with rooting in and allowing yourself to receive. Yeah, beautiful. I mean, we talked about at the beginning, I think, you know, in this winter, how the sap retreats deep into the earth, only to allow that process to then bring forward life, you know, allow the blossoms to be felt and experienced again and again and again. Tidiago, just tell me some more about She Roars. I mean, I love the title, I love the name. Tell me more, how can I roar? <laughs> you already are. And I think, um, I know and I trust that um, this is what is needed now more than ever. This roar, and you know, the roar, it's very much like, like <laughs> but in many ways, it's also can be as gentle as it needs to be. It's the embodiment of your power, you know, and it could be fierce and, you know, very loud, and it could be, um, it could be silent and, and introspective. All of that is your power. And she wars is the acknowledgement of that spectrum and the acknowledgement of the power. In many ways to connect to what we're saying is rewriting every story that has tried to say anything different around that power of vulnerability, of femininity, of, um, of, 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 of women as a, as a being and to really tell a different story and own a different story. So the, the organization started in 2017 and it's been such a beautiful journey of connecting thousands of women to their heart, right? It's as simple as that. Do you know the power of, that you carry within? Let me show you. Let me invite you into your own truth. And from there, can you hear yourself roar? Can you feel yourself roar? So you hear the words, the feel, the, um, the hearing, and it's all very much a conscious act of connecting that we might hear, that we might feel, that we might know. And when we, 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 we move through life from a space of knowing, there's so much power in it. Um, so my, my desire is that every human um, but most certainly supporting a lot of women who are so powerful can step into this power, into this knowing, and um, be such powerful agents of transformation that is needed today, um, that is anchored in Ubuntu, it's anchored in the heart, and the power of the guidance that is within each one of each and every one of us. So... Tidiago, thank you so, so much. It's been such a beautiful time together and to hear you. And um, I'll share your details. So do check out Tidiago, her website, have a read of some beautiful articles that she shares. And hopefully this will be a step towards connecting deeper with your role. So Tidiago, thank you. Oh my goodness, thank you to Zine. You are light and I'm so blessed that our paths have crossed this way. And I trust that um, your role will continue to inspire so many to roar in turn. God willing. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>